we just had uh, Senators, uh, we just had Senators Hackett and uh, Chairman Hill from the House Ag Committee, along with John Patterson and myself, in Ashtabula to talk about Senate Bill 1 that was passed in the last General Assembly and how that would affect the Lake Erie area here in Ashtabula. Right now the bill is designed to affect the northwestern part of the lake, which is the Toledo area, uh, and the alga, alga blooms that they've had over there. Uh, what the concern is, there's a dichotomy in the lake. There's two different parts. Our part is not affected in the same way that over in the western part, uh, the western basin would be. And if we were to impose the same restrictions on the agriculture committee, uh, agriculture community uh, that they have over in the western part of the state, it could affect how the lake is, uh, uh, the farming's done, you know, and things like that. So we brought them up to talk about that, that the concerns that, that are over there in western half of the state are not the same here in uh, Ashtabula County in our part of the lake. We have deeper basins that the water goes into. We have a uh, different type of farming. We have different types of streams and rivers that help, help offset a lot of those phosphorus that are going into the lake and causing those. So, you know, that's very important to talk about to make sure that as we look at legislation moving forward that we're doing right legislation that's going to not over affect the area, that we don't over-regulate it, and that we keep the farmers and that type of business in mind, and we put in the right rules for this part of the state. And I think that's very important. What kind of rules would that be? Well, how, whether or not you can put manure down in the wintertime, how much phosphorus can you put in that, until it affects the, you know, the lake. You know, everyone wants to protect a lake. It's our greatest natural resource, uh, I think, for the state, let alone for this area right here. And we've got to make sure we do it right. However, we don't want to overregulate and take businesses out that don't really affect the lake. So we've got to make sure there's a proper balance, and uh, the legislation we would look at is to make sure that is done. We're talking to the experts. Ohio State Extension was up here uh, going through some of those, you know, amounts of phosphorus and the different types of farming that could be utilized. Where does that bill stand at now? Well, we're still in the research and fact finding. However, we believe that something may be coming up here in the near future. Uh, probably we're going to see something moving in the end of uh, March, beginning of April. So quickly, uh, as you see in the west part of the lake, they're still having problems there. and you know, depending on how this winter and the spring turn out, whether or not we're going to see those big alga blooms again. So we want to get ahead of it. But we want to make sure that we're not over-regulating that affects this part of the lake because they're not the same. There's different tributaries, there are different uh, environmental impacts and effects that are here that aren't there that diminish that type of algae bloom here. So the Western Basin Pirate require stricter regulation. Yes. Are and how you know the tributaries are. There are a lot. There's not as many. They're not as the lake over there is not as deep. So it, the algae is able to eat that phosphorus at a greater rate than it would here. So there, there's two different. It's almost two different lakes, and we got to just make sure that we protect the whole lake by watching both sides. School funding is always a concern that we have. Uh, you know we. And in the 32nd district, it's across. When you look at Trumbull and Ashtabula and, you know, that part of Geauga, funding has always been a problem. And, you know, we've had so many cuts to the local schools that you've seen levies uh, in almost every, every part of the 32nd district. So what we're trying to do is work with our counterparts to, sit, you know, across the aisle to say, look, this is affecting us. We're sure it's affecting you as well. We need to get back to some sound uh, funding for our schools because we can't continue to kick the can down the road to try to pass this on to the locals when we're still taking the same tax base and not returning it back to the, to the local schools. So we're trying to find a balance there that we can get more money back to our schools. So property taxes are part of it.
Um, but we need to really look at, uh, you know, in some cases, whether some schools need to be uh, combined. Uh, you know, I have in, in Trumbull County a school that has 40 students graduating. And, you know, to keep that school open, they, they can't afford to fix their boiler. Uh, the high school is from 1910. They don't make parts for many parts of that school. So what do we do with that? Do we, you know, keep it there and, you know, it's affecting the students and we're not being proper guardians of their education by keeping it open? Do we split it up and send it to the different districts? There's a lot that we have to look at to decide. And this is a community problem because, you know, schools are our, one, our future, but they affect the community so much that the community has to come together and they have to come up with what they want the response to be. And that's what we're trying to do, trying to hear from our local schools, our local residents, what they need. But at the same time, we understand we still, no matter what, need to get funding back to our, our local schools. School resource with the shootings that we're having, that is definitely something that we've been talking about. The debate is there. You look at what's going on in Florida with their debate, arming students, or arming, arming uh, teachers. In Ohio, we've already passed that legislation that student, if a teacher wants to be armed and the school board uh, allows it, and they go through the proper training, they can carry a firearm at school. And, you know, when you look at how rural 32nd District is, Trumbull County and Ashabula specifically, you know, it could take a police officer 20 minutes to get to a school and for backup to come, it could take even longer. So, you know, these shootings happen in mere minutes and for during a shooting in that crisis, every second counts. So, as long, you know, we got to make sure that the teachers that are carrying are properly trained and that is part of the legislation that was passed uh, in past General Assemblies. Now, will that require additional funding to make sure they're properly trained? Or that's, that's always, funding is always important to make sure training is done. Um, right now, it's done at the local level. Uh, whether or not the school, you know, it's between the police, police department and the local school, whether or not a resource officer is in there, and that is not done by the state to determine that. However, if funding and more funding could be handed down, they could use that money for a resource officer. So it is something we're looking at and talking about, especially when you see what's happening in Florida and across the country, really. Well, the governor has come out and, you know, the governor's passed every gun bill that's come across his desk. And there's a couple gun bills that are working their way through uh, in the Senate and the Judiciary Committee that I happen to sit on. So there are, is some legislation there. Stand your ground, uh, and it comes to mind. Uh, in that bill, they changed the self-defense uh, whole uh, burden on the proof goes to the prosecutors now instead of the, the defendant. So there's a big realm of changes relating to guns that have been in the works. However, with these shootings, it's kind of slowed down a little bit. And the governor said that he would not sign a bill that uh, had stand your ground in it. So I think we're starting to see a change at the executive level on guns. I think he's going to look at that a little bit more than he has before and really examine the legislation. We just introduced the capital budget that is currently in the House. Uh, in that, Ashabula got about two, $2.1 million in uh, capital projects, uh, money allocated for capital projects here. One of the big one is, and much needed, is the juvenile court. Uh, Court is really dilapidated and kind of old and aging. And part of the money that we got was about $500,000 for that. And when you combine that with what we're looking to try and get from DYS, Department of Youth Services from the state, and any federal money that we can get, uh, we will be able to uh, fix that building up and renovate it and make it useful again. It's very chopped up. And it's it's really not a good facility right now, but with these with this money, we'll hopefully be able to make changes to the building. So where is that money coming from? That money will come from the capital budget, which is money earmarked in the state that's used for these types of pro programs improvements. Um, you know, we work closely with uh, Judge Kenneth Caplice. 
uh, Larry Offbaum, who is the president of the Senate, and it, you know he's from Ashtabula, and he understands the needs that we have here. And he was a great ally in helping us get a lot of this funding. John Patterson as well. You know, it took a group effort working together uh, that made this happen. We worked with the juvenile judge to get this funding. He was very instrumental. He helped, uh, first of all, he arranged tours for us so that we could get the, understand what was going on there. And then, you know, he himself solicited letters to the Senate, helped testify uh, about the juvenile facility. And Representative John Patterson was very important in helping us get a lot of this funding. He and I worked together, he in the House, I in the Senate, and by having a common voice with a common goal, we were able to achieve that. And, you know, working with Larry Offbaugh and Cliff Rosenberger, who is the Speaker of the House, uh, they understand that in our area we have needs. And, you know, we've been overlooked for so many years from Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Columbus, the three C's. We were able to get in there and fight and get a significant amount of money back to Ashtabula. Uh, a lot more than most uh, counties in the uh, state. So we're pretty proud of that. One of the biggest ones that we're dealing with is opiate addiction. That is, you know, when you look at what opiates in this epidemic has done to our community, you know, not, not just the lives that it's interrupted, the person who's doing the drugs, the family members that have to deal with it, uh, the amount of money that's spent at hospitals, first responders, uh, paying for the Narcan, uh, going on the runs time and time again, even to the same home over and over again. Uh, the, f the effect this has on our jails, you know, that's a cost that you know, when you incarcerate somebody, it costs a lot of money to keep them there. When you look at what's happened with children's services, uh, having to take kids into their care and trying to find foster care. And that's why we're trying to work with Homes for Kids to get foster care for them. Because, you know, in uh, talking with Annette Palmer from uh, Homes for Kids, and she indicated there's such a big need. There's over 300 children in foster care in Ashtabula with only 44 homes or people available for that foster care. So there's a huge need, and we have to examine this problem and look at it from a community standpoint, because it affects the entire community. It's a community problem, so it's going to require a community solution. And we all have to come together to, you know, address it. You know, a lot of people say, well, this, you know, it's not my kid, it's not my family, but it's your neighbor. And it is somebody else's mother, brother, sister. This epidemic has affected so many people, and it doesn't matter if you're white, black, green, yellow, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, it transcends all social classes that we have. So right now this epidemic is one of the major problems that we're having here in Ashtabula, in the 32nd District, our country and our state. It's something that we're trying to do come up with different ideas, how do we com combat this? And what we're seeing too is a rise in cart fentanyl and fentanyl. And it's such a powerful drug that just using it one time, you be, your brain actually changes its chemical uh, composition and seeks that, you, you're immediately addicted. And that's how powerful these drugs are. And they're easy to get they're, and cheap. So we've got to find a way to deal with the addiction. You know, we, we saw prescription drugs as the initial problem, but that we're seeing a leveling off and an even decrease in overdoses due to prescription drugs. But we're seeing an increase in cocaine now, and that's being mixed with the fentanyl and car fentanyl, and methamphetamines are back, and even marijuana laced with these powerful drugs. So the drug trends change, but addiction doesn't. You have to look at drug addiction and how do we combat that? Uh, how, how do we, you know, what, what's causing it? Well, poverty is one. Education's one, uh, unemployment's one. Um, there's so many different factors that we have to look at and try and combat that will help. It's just not getting the drugs off the streets. It's not just locking somebody up because they can't arrest their way out of it. Once they get out of jail, they're going back to the problems. Once they get out, that cause them to start using and then they're right back where they weren't gonna use again. So what we have to do is try and find a way around that. Um, and that's the difficult part, but it's something we recognize and something we're working on at the state level.
I've talked to law enforcement. It's a legislative change they'd like to see, whereas uh, one reason a DCI takes a long time mm -hmm. to test the drug yep. to see what they're, whether they're dealing with heroin, carfentanil, or fentanyl. Sure. And another thing they don't like is they it's a like a third degree felony with heroin. Right. It's only a fifth degree felony for fentanyl or carfentanil. And we change that. Yeah, so we've we've introduced bills that have addressed that. If there's fentanyl or carfentanil in there, we've updated our laws to reflect that and increase the penalties. Part of the problem that we see is, you know, with DCI is they were never designed to test drugs on this magnitude. Uh, and that is a huge expense when you look at all the different drugs that they now have to deal with. And when... Uh, Carfentanil and fentanyl, all you need is just a few specks of it. I mean, it's, people don't understand. If you took a penny and covered Abraham Lincoln's uh, beard with carfentanil or fentanyl, that's enough to kill about 100 people. I mean, just that little bit. So, you know, to test these, to get, you know, first of all, all that testing done is very expensive. And it's a huge strain on law enforcement. You had... The fact that they have to arrest people and put them in jail, that's a huge expense. When they have to go and revive them with Narcan, because uh, law enforcement does that, that's an expense. When you have to go to the same place over and over again, the same home or same apartment, that is a huge expense. So it's a huge strain on our first responders, especially law enforcement. So we, we're working with homes for kids that are currently based in Trumbull County. But there's such a need in Ashtabula County for foster care to get children who are subjects of this epidemic and other reasons that have come in their lives that their parents are no longer able to care for them, to get foster care for them. And there's well over 300 children right now who are in the state's care who we can't get to foster care. We can't get into a home. And that's very important. Uh, when you look at the stability of the child and the ability of the child to become a productive person in society, uh, they need that, those ground roots. And Homes for Kids can help provide that, working with the Children's Services here in Ashtabula, our county commissioners to get some funding. Uh, they will be able to provide a lot of the foster care that these, these kids need. And we've been working with Danette Palmer, uh, who's working with us in Trumbull County and bringing her up here to Ashtabula County to meet with our, her Ashtabula counterparts to get it going up here. My name is Danette Palmer. I'm the Marketing Development Manager for Homes for Kids and Child and Family Solutions. We are a um, foster care and home-based behavioral health agency headquartered in Niles uh, since 1990, but we serve um, Honing, Trumbull, Columbiana counties, and we're working with Ashtabula County for about the last two years with juvenile court. Um, and we've been working with uh, Children's Services here in Ashtabula for a number of years. Now, are you private or state? We're a private nonprofit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we license our own family foster homes through, through the state of Ohio. And um, as Senator O'Brien said, there is a great need for foster homes um, here in Ashtabula County um, because they honestly just don't have enough. And with the opioid epidemic um, that is just running rampant, um, there's over 300 kids in care in Ashtabula County alone. So um, we're working with the local agencies to try to recruit foster homes. Um, when kids come into care, they have a goal of three things. They're either to be reunited with their family, be adopted, or age out of the system. So being also a behavioral health agency, um, all of our kids receive counseling. And whatever other skills that they need to overcome um, the trauma that they've suffered, many of the kids have suffered from either physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, um, or have witnessed trauma to a family member. Um, could be from the opioid epidemic or, or something similar that's happened in their life. So we're in need of foster homes. They can be, you know, single um, single parents. It could be um, a family. Um, you have to have another income. Be 21 years of age or older, be in the state of Ohio, um, you receive reimbursement daily um, for taking the kids into care. You have to be able to be a little patient, um, be, provide, be able to provide guidance and support. 
and we teach you the skills that you need. We offer 24 hour seven support, um, so we always have somebody on call that's available to deal with a crisis. And we have pre-service classes that are available now, because um, we do have to have 36 hours of, um, of classes to be able to be licensed, go through the home study, have uh, BCI and FBI background checks. They're taught everything from um, how to deal with a crisis, how to handle behavior management, how to um, CPR, first aid, you know, crisis response, um, how to deal with um, diseases, things like that, a little bit of everything, you know, kind of run the gamut of how you need to really um, be able to help a child overcome what they've endured. It depends on the family, uh, but we can license usually between six months to a year. It kind of just depends on the situation. It, it's a big process to go through. Um, the home has to be inspected, a lot of paperwork, things like that. But, you know, that's what we do. It kind of depends, but the average is usually about nine months to a year. Um, but it can be longer, just depending on what the child's situation is. And we do have a lot of foster parents that once they become a foster parent, they adopt. So that's also, you know, a possibility. Those who are interested in adopting should consider becoming a foster parent. And we're also looking for kinship caregivers. For those that have a family member that's a, a child in foster care, they need um, kinship caregivers. Because obviously if they're be able, able to be reunited with a family member, that's even better. If you've ever thought about it at all, if you've ever, you know, wanted to make a difference in the life of a child and thought, you know, this is something I could really, really help with, you know, please give us a call. Um, you can visit our website at hfk.org. Um, we have a, our phone number is 330-544-8005. You can always contact um, Trumbull County, or I'm sorry, Ashtabula County Juvenile Court. They can give you our information as well. The funding that you get comes from where? Our funding's a mixture of um, state funding through local children's services boards that's passed down to us, um, Medicaid for the counseling, and we do get grants and we have fundraisers as well. So it's a combination. Where does the most money come from? Most of the money comes from Medicaid and the children's services boards. Do you have any statistics, especially in Nashville, how many kids are in foster care and then number of people who provide it. I'll tell you in the state that there's 16,000 kids in foster care in the state of Ohio. And it's predicted to be over 20,000 by the year 2020. Um, just because of the, the drug problem that we are facing is, is their main reason for that. And then um, in Ashtabula, there's 313 children, I believe, in foster care. And then there's 44 homes, um, 44 foster homes that Ashtabula County currently has.